This is the Naked Genetics Podcast, taking a look inside your genes. Forty years ago, Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene hit the shelves. We look back on how it changed the way many people think about genetics. I think the most important thing about it was that it was written in 1976. And that was the prehistory of genetics. I mean, that was the pre-Cambrian of genetics. We didn't know any genetics at all. Plus, linking nurture to nature and a gigantic gene of the month. This is the Naked Genetics podcast for August 2016 with me, Dr Kat Arney, brought to you in association with the Genetics Society, online at genetics.org.uk. The genes are the immortals, or rather, they are defined as genetic entities that come close to deserving the title. We, the individual survival machines in the world, can expect to live a few more decades. But the genes in the world have an expectation of life that must be measured not in decades, but in thousands of millions of years. In a sexually reproducing species, the individual is too large and too temporary a genetic unit to qualify as a significant unit of natural selection. The group of individuals is an even larger unit. Genetically speaking, individuals and groups are like clouds in the sky or dust clouds in the desert. They are temporary aggregations or federations. They are not stable through evolutionary time. That's a quote from The Selfish Gene, Richard Dawkins' landmark book that was first published in 1976. I caught up with fellow genetics author and emeritus professor of genetics at UCL, Steve Jones, to find out how the book and the ideas in it were received when it first came out. I have to say, in a rather embarrassed way, I didn't read it for many years after that. And in fact, I think its initial impact was much less than its medium-term impact. And I should also say, perhaps in my own defence, that I didn't read The Origin of Species, which I've become obsessed with, until I was in my 30s. So, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yes, I, re- I read it. and I think, it would, it, I think the most important thing about it was that it was written in 1976. And that was the prehistory of genetics. I mean, that was the pre-Cambrian of genetics. We didn't know any genetics at all, basically. We knew about Mendel's laws and we knew a bit about the mechanisms and we knew about DNA. But, um, you know, genetics has moved so far forward since 1976 that you can't expect all uh, Dawkins's claims to have stood up. I mean, no scientific theory can stand up in the face of a, such a torrent of, uh, of new information, which isn't, which isn't to uh, deny the fact that it's a very important book in the public perception of genetics. From what I feel, it was sort of one of the first public books really writing about neo-Darwinism, trying to get Darwin's ideas about natural selection along with genetics and what we understood about evolution. Yes, there were some semi-popular books before then. John Maynard Smith had written one. I mean, speaking as an author, and uh, you you yourself, of course, are are an author, it's extremely hard to predict which books become bestsellers and which aren't. Publishers know that full well. I mean, more than half the books they publish make a loss but they know that very occasionally something will explode, and this one did. And I think it deserved to explode because it's a very engaging book. It's certainly, if you look at the effect it's had on the public interest in biology, I think it had a seminal effect on that. Now, I'm certainly not putting Dawkins up at the Darwin level, and I don't think he would either. He's a, he's a reasonably modest man. But I think he played a large part in persuading the public that genetics and evolution had a lot to do with each other. Now, that fight had gone on throughout the 1920s, where for quite a long time there was a feeling that somehow genetics disproved Darwinism, um, that it, you know, the evolution happened with giant leaps in muta- big mutations. Um, so that all really happened beneath the public radar. And what Richard Dawkins did was to bring it into the public eye. And I don't actually think, and I think, he himself would probably agree uh, that all his ideas have stood up and there's still a lot of controversy about them. 
So let's explore some of the ideas in the book. I mean, the book's called The Selfish Gene, and there's a lot to unpack there about what do we mean by selfishness, because yes. this isn't a conscious gene going, oh, I'm going to be selfish today. What, what did he actually mean yes. by that? Well, you know, I mean, <laughs> I once said to him, you, you know, you could have called that book The Effect of Kin Selection on Sex Ratios. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, and and there are there are books you know which have got titles like that. I think he did talk about changing it at one time at the thirtieth anniversary ten years ago. I think he said, as far as I remember, that he preferred to call it the immortal gene. Yeah, yeah, it's in the and, preface. Yeah. And if he'd called it that, it would have sold one tenth as many copies. So I think it's as a popular science book, I, as I often say, that with, with the first line in the United States Army's mule training manual how to train a mule, is first catch the animal's attention by striking it smartly between the eyes with a stout stick. Okay? And that's what he's doing with that title. He's, he's, he's uh, striking the potential purchaser smartly between the eyes, the selfish gene, with a stout stick. Uh, so the purchaser will take it out of the shelf, open it up, and then buy it. The problem is that What's happened really is it's it sort of got into a circular, boring argument about what you mean by selfish. You know, bits of DNA aren't selfish. They don't drive sentient beings. I mean, sentient beings can be selfish, but the, the word isn't quite right. But I don't think that's crucial. Let's explore what that actually means. So what was the central idea that he proposed in the book? Well, well the central idea was, was Haldane's idea. Oh, in fact, it's, it's, you, can, you can dig it out in the ancient literature. Haldane once said it would pay him to leap into the Thames to save two brothers or eight cousins, okay? And the point was that he would destroy his own genome by drowning in the Thames, but if he saved eight cousins, the, each of which shared one-eighth of his genome, by definition, um, then he would, there would be no genetic loss. Um, so if he saved nine cousins or ten cousins or twenty cousins, he would actually pay him to drown. Okay? And Haldane being Haldane just threw that off as a jeu d'esprit, but in fact it makes, a, it makes a, an important point. It's this idea that it's the genes that are what's being selected for. It's the genes that get passed on at the expense of the organism. And I think the phrase that he uses, it's, it's all about the replicator, about copying your genes rather than the vehicle, you know, the, the flesh robot that they end yeah. up in. Yeah, it kind of comes down to, in the end, it comes down to theology, okay? Um, you know, Christians have got this thing called the soul. Now, you know, nobody knows what the soul is, but the soul somehow survives where... Uh, uh, it's 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 you know it's the selfish soul. It survives where its uh, its agent, you and I, um, don't. And when you try to track down by what you what you mean by the replicator, it's by no means clear in modern genetics context. I mean, one of the startling things about modern genetics, as of course you're aware, um, is the discovery that there are far fewer genes in the human genome in the traditional sense than we ever imagined. I mean, when I was a student in Edinburgh, which was a very big center of genetics in those days, and still is to a degree, um, in the 60s, you know, we used to assume, I used to assume, that to make anything as magnificent and handsome, as sexy as myself, would take a million genes, a million protein, protein lo loci, you know, it's an incredibly complicated machine. Well, in the end, we only got 23,000 of them. And, you know, you're left with the fact that 98.5% of the genome is not coding replicators. Now, what it is, we don't know. The other thing, which again, I don't think Richard's or the simplistic idea of the selfish replicator stands up well against is the discovery of the so-called missing heritability, where you take something like human height, where you know um, from the points of view of families, but using family studies and adoptions and all these things, um, it's, it's extremely clear that about 80% of the variation in human height in any population um, is due to genetic variation. Okay, it's a highly heritable concept. But when people try to look at the, look for the genes behind that high heritability, it's not that they don't find it, they find too many. Last time I looked, and I haven't looked for a while, um, there was about 150 or 200 different gene loci had been implicated in the inheritance of variation in human height within a population. And that, but it only explained about 10% of the total variation. So it's quite conceivable that all genes affect all phenotypes. 
Um, I mean, that's putting it a bit too. It's a, putting it a bit too gra grandly, but it's not inconceivable that every gene affects everything, and everything is affected by every gene. Now, in that case, the idea that you can disentangle individual replicators as being selfish begins to look very murky. I have seen some people trying to take Dawkins' ideas of the selfish gene and apply them you know, to political and oh, social oh, yeah, ideas as well. And tell me a bit about how that's panned out. Well, it hasn't panned out at all well, is the problem. And it's a very old problem. Um, I, I, I go back to Darwin again. My favourite quote from Darwin, which really summarises the history of genetics from the beginning, okay, is that ignorance more frequently breeds confidence than does knowledge. In other words, if you don't know something, it's terribly easy to be 100% confident in what you say. Okay? And you can see that throughout the history of genetics. Now, Francis Galton, Charles Darwin's cousin, who founded the Galton Lab at UCL, where I work, he wrote a book, of course you know, called Hereditary Genius. And Galton was a very, very clever man. There's no question of that. Uh, interested in human, uh, in, in human qualities. Um, and his argument was that there was a terrible problem we faced because people of low quality, um, people who went to, you know, King's College London, let's say, uh, were reproducing more than people of high quality who went to University College London. Okay, And we should do something about that. And he wrote a quite bizarre but letter to nature, which has been forgotten, which is called Africa for the Chinese. And he basically recommends that the Africans just go away and die and let the Chinese come in because the Chinese were biologically superior to Africans. Now, and that, of course, as we go through the 19th and into the 20th century. That had a big effect. Plenty of people, when I was a lad, would regard Africans as being subhuman. Um, and it had a terrible effect, as of course we know, in the eugenics movement, again, which began in Britain at, uh, with Galton and the Galton Laboratory and was very strong at UCL. Now, we look back to the 1930s. What did we know about human genetics? Zero. Uh, you know, was it, oh, 0.601% of what we know today. And yet people were going out sterilizing people and the like um, with complete confidence. And the attempt to use biology of any kind to explain human society are all like that. You're a writer of popular genetics books. I have absolutely loved reading your books and found them incredibly informative. Uh, I'm now a writer of books, one book, uh, and I do a lot of public communication about genetics. It really feels like The Selfish Gene was the first book to pave the way for this kind of communication. Oh, well, I think, I think it was. I mean, I'm not, I'm not putting it down. I mean, I, I think it was. I mean, uh, on a couple of occasions, I've had students come to me and say, oh, I came into genetics because of the selfish gene. And, you know, and I think that's true, and that's a very important effect it's had. On two occasions, I've had the rather amusing uh, experience of having students come up to me with a copy of the selfish gene and ask me to, asking me to sign the book. <laughs> And what I've done on both those occasions is to write, um, I, did not sign this, I did not write this book, Steve Jones. And as I was writing that sentence, it struck me that's the saddest sentence I've ever written because it sold more than a million copies. Okay, I wish I had written the book. In the history of the perception of biology, it's an extremely important book. I'd be the first person to, to say that and to welcome that. That's writer and geneticist Steve Jones from UCL. <laughs> You're listening to the Naked Genetics podcast with me, Dr. Kat Arney. Still to come, our gene of the month is truly titanic. But first, it's time to turn to the eternal struggle, the battle between nature and nurture. Over recent years, scientists have used huge genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, to find hundreds of genetic variations linked to a huge range of traits and diseases. But they're still missing something. And we know even less about how factors in the environment influence how our genes are turned on and off, something known as epigenetics. Now, Vardman Rakyan and his team from Queen Mary University of London have discovered that tiny chemical tags, called DNA methylation, on repetitive genes, known as ribosomal or RDNA, could be passing information from one generation to the next, building a bridge between the effects of nature our genes, and nurture the environment. I suppose the core question is what determines a person's phenotype, the way they look, um, the diseases they're susceptible to. Now, in recent years, 
probably the biggest advance in terms of understanding phenotypes has been at the, at the level of um, genetics. That's the DNA that you've got? Yes, yes, exactly, that's exactly right. And this has been made possible by um, these very large-scale studies where people have looked across the entire genome and looked at a lot of genetic variants in lots and lots of people. And they have indeed found for many diseases and phenotypes that there are uh, genetic variants associated with diseases such as uh, type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, cancers and so on. I personally think that these genome-wide association studies, as they're called GWASs, have been very successful. Although one big surprise after these studies have been conducted over the last uh, seven, eight years is that in almost every case, we can still explain only a small proportion of um, the heritability. Um, in sort of straightforward terms, it means how much of a person's sort of specific phenotype of disease is determined by genetic variation. There are precise definitions, but operationally, that, that's fine. So for some diseases, we know that a certain proportion of it should be in the genes, but when you start looking for it, you don't find that much. Yeah, d yes, um, in, in manner of speaking, yes. Um, now, where is, so people are calling this the missing heritability. So where is this missing heritability? Um, people now looking for rarer variants. So for example, there could be only one person out of a thousand who has this particular variant. Um, so we need to do as people are doing now, more sequencing, looking at more individuals. But there are suggestions that the missing heritability may lie elsewhere. It could be epigenetics, or it could be in other parts of the genome that we simply have not looked at. There's a lot, there's a lot of the genome that we have not looked at, such as the repetitive portion of the genome. So a lot of um, repeat elements, uh, retro elements, and ribosomal DNA. So ribosome, ribosomal DNA codes for the ribosome, the protein production machinery of the cell. They're like the sort of the molecular chefs that make the stuff that makes our cells. Yeah, yeah. So, um, the surprising thing about our DNA is that there are many copies of it spread across different chromosomes. That's true in humans, true in uh, all mammals. So as an example, I could have just 40 copies of it, of our DNA, and you could have 200 copies of the our DNA. Does that mean that I'm loads better at making proteins than you are? Oh, uh, well, surprisingly not. A lot of these copies are silenced, are epigenetically silenced, in fact. So this has been known for a long time, that the number of copies can vary. Uh, amongst individuals. What is not that well known though is each individual copy within a person within a single genome can vary genetically. So in the mice that we looked at these are inbred mice that is they've been bred together to try and eliminate genetic variation which can be a confounder in a variety of studies. So so this was a surprise that even within an inbred mouse, which will have many copies of our DNA, just like humans would, even with an inbred mouse, individual copies within a single mouse will be genetically different. What was the idea for this study? What, what were you trying to look for? What we were really interested in is how the maternal in utero environment influences the offspring's phenotype. So basically, like, what your mum's tummy does to a baby. Yeah, kind of like it's that. Really, yeah. really, yeah. really crudely. Yeah, because yeah, a, a fetus is gestating in there. It's, it's not in a completely sealed box. It's inside a female. That's right, yeah. So it's exposed to the mum's um, environmental condition, whether depending on what the mum eats or doesn't eat and other factors like smoking... And so what we were interested in was in this process called developmental programming. In utero, when a fetus is exposed to various environmental factors, how does that affect phenotype postnatally, after the, after the baby's born, as an adult, and so on? 
and there have been a lot of suggestions, a lot of excellent work has been done by groups in the UK and, uh, and overseas um, that have shown that in some cases epigenetic marks in the offspring can be changed as a result of the mother's environment. So this is things happening to the mum that are somehow being written in in these marks in the baby's DNA? Yeah, so, um, so another way of putting it is that these epigenetic changes represent a molecular memory of what the fetus was exposed to. So that was the driver for our project. So what did you do? What did you look at? So we, in our model, we looked at the effect of protein. Uh, we compared um, pregnant mums on a normal protein diet, which is 20% protein, versus mothers on a uh, slightly lower protein diet, 80% um, protein. The offspring look healthy. There, there's no, there's no uh, major effects. One big thing type, though, is the offspring of low-protein mums are approximately 25% smaller. A little dinky mice. <laughs> they are small, yeah. After we found that, so that's been shown also a number of times. And it's one reason why we chose this model, because it's, it's been done a number of times, and it's a very robust phenotype. So then we wanted to ask, can we see DNA methylation differences that associate with the smaller birth weight? When we when you when you take sort of standard analytical procedures, you map to the unique part of the genome. That's the easiest way to look at the data. No, we found nothing. So we then noticed that there was one part of the genome where we did see a very big methylation difference, but this was in the part of the genome that is not um, at a unique portion. It was it seemed to be like a fragment of something else. And then when we looked at this uh, in more detail, we realised it was very similar to our DNA, to ribosomal DNA. So it's not the kind of protein coding genes, it's not the, the honest-to-God real genes, if you want to call them that, it's these ribosomal DNA genes. What difference do you see between the mice that were fed high protein and the mice that were fed low protein? Okay, so the mice that were fed low protein showed more methylation. Now, essentially what that means is with more methylation, especially in the promoter region, the region that controls the expression of a gene, that turns gene expression down. And this makes sense. Now, there, so you have this fetus developing inside a mom who's not getting enough protein. So the cells of the fetus, are, you know, are are thinking, well, hang on a minute, we're not getting enough protein, so let's tune down protein production. And we can do that um, in some ways, but not making as many ribosomes. Hence, we methylate our ribosomal DNA, and that copes with um, the stressful conditions they're experiencing. So this is almost a prediction that, OK, we're not getting much protein now, we might not have much protein in the future, let's not try and do too much molecular cooking with all of this. Let's just uh, wait and see. Trying to carry out things as they would have been carried out might not be the best strategy here. Let's, let's slow down protein production. We can have a smaller organism, but one that actually lives because that's the goal, really. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're a small baby, but as long as you're on a live baby that yes. works. Indeed, yes, that's correct. Not only are there these epigenetic differences depending on whether the mum gets more protein or not, but there also seem to be genetic differences, differences in the DNA sequence. What influence does that seem to have on the baby? OK, now that was a really big surprise. So when we looked at these RDNA copies further, we realised they were genetically different. Now, this is, um, genetic differences within our DNA in the mass have been shown before. But for us, this we were looking at an inbred strain, though. And this was really surprising that this had not been shown, because we would have assumed that with inbreeding, all these genetic differences would have been essentially bred out. So that's when we found these genetic differences. Essentially, we found two types of our DNA. One, which we can call the A variant, because it has a specific uh, nucleotide in the promoter, A. And another called the C variant, because it has a C in that same position. Different copies will have a C 
whereas other copies will have an A. So we compared the A variant to the C variant. And to our surprise, most of the epigenetic changes, that is increased methylation, was occurring at the A variant. So, okay, what I've told you so far is that within a single genome, there will be some A variants, some C variants. But the next thing we found was that the relative number of A variants to C variants varied from mouse to mouse, from brother to sister. If you were to look at, in mice, in fact, even in humans, if you were to look at the genetic variation of, uh, you know, the mum and the dad, there's, you can only predict the genetic variation in our DNA of the offspring with only a certain degree of probability. You cannot predict it with 100% certainty. Um, so this was really surprising. And so then what, when we sort of uh, investigated further, we found that it was the mice which have more of these A variant RDNA copies that seemed to attract more methylation and ended up being smaller. That was the, uh, the sort of key finding and the key message of our uh, paper. So this is a really incredible example of its nature. It's the DNA sequence and its nurture. It's something happening to the mum, a change in her diet, making this change in the babies. Has this kind of really strong link been found before? Almost any phenotype is due to both genes and environment. So in our opinion, this provides a very unique example and I, th I think very strong example of how genes interact with the environment to influence phenotypes. So this is not by any stretch of the imagination a purely epigenetic effect, not at all. Uh, what we're saying is that the underlying genetics is absolutely key, but that underlying genetics becomes important when exposed to a certain environment. There is a lot of discussion about the rise in diseases, things like type 2 diabetes, rises in obesity, and trying to work out how do we link changes in diet, unhealthy diet, in parents, in, in fathers and mothers, to what we're seeing now in populations. Do you think that this is the link that we've been looking for? Ooh, I wouldn't say it's the link, but I think it could be important for sure. Um, we will only really know after we've been able to design proper, powerful assays for it. So lots of this, you know, I mean, was all science, technology and scientific discoveries go hand in hand. So in terms of what it means for humans, um, we've got a clear idea of what we want to do. For the next few years at least, we want to develop uh, our ability to be able to look at it. And then I might have, hopefully, <laughs> an answer. That's what we're aiming towards. Vardman Rakian from Queen Mary University of London. And that work was published last month in the journal Science. And if you're interested in finding out more about how traits are passed on down the generations, do check out my recent documentary for BBC Radio 4 called Down the Generations. The link is on the page for this podcast at nakedscientist.com slash genetics. And finally, it's time for our gene of the month, and this time it's Titan. One of the biggest genes in the genome, it was first discovered in the late 1970s when the Titan protein was found in chicken breast muscle cells. Named for its enormous size, just think of the Titanic, Titan encodes a large structural protein that's important for making muscles work properly. One of its key roles is in the heart, and around one in four people with a serious heart condition called dilated cardiomyopathy are known to have faults in their Titan gene. But many more people in the general population also carry faults in Titan, but don't seem to have a heart problem. Researchers are now looking in more detail to find out exactly which faults in Titan are related to heart disease. Given that dilated cardiomyopathy can cause serious illness and death, knowing more about the bad versions of Titan should help to identify families and individuals at risk, so they can be closely monitored for any signs of ticker trouble. That's all for now. I'll be back next month wishing a very happy birthday to the world's most famous sheep. No prizes for guessing who. If you've got any questions or feedback, just email me at genetics at thenakedscientist.com. You can also get in touch through the main Naked Scientist's Facebook page or by tweeting me at Naked Genetics. 
Every episode of the Naked Genetics podcast is available on iTunes and online at nakedscientist.com slash genetics. The Naked Genetics podcast is brought to you in association with the Genetics Society, online at genetics.org.uk. I'll see you next month for another peek inside your genes. <laughs>